uh, we'll get on in this joint shareholders meeting. Um, welcome to IHL Chair, uh, Sue Sheldon and directors um, of the company, uh, and also to the new um, uh, Executive Officer, Mark. Uh, welcome on. This is your first meeting, so uh, welcome along. I'll just open with Kato Kia. Kia tau mai te mara matanga, kia tau mai te rangi mari e, kia tau mai te kaha me te aroha mō tēnei kaupapa hui e tai ki e. Uh, we have apology from uh, Councillor Hill, so someone move. Councillor uh, Matthew Benj. Councillor uh, Benj. And Councillor Benj, so both Councillor Benj and Councillor Hill moved by uh, Councillor Courtney, seconded by uh, Councillor Dowler. All those in favour, please say aye. The gains carried. Are there any declarations of interest in relation to anything on today's agenda? There are not. Uh, we have confirmation of the minutes, both open and confidential. Uh, I'll take the open minutes first. From the 16th of April, moved Mayor Smith, seconded uh, Councillor McKenzie. All in favour, please say aye. And in terms of the confidential minutes from the same day, uh, moved Mayor Smith, seconded Councillor Courtney. All in favour, please say aye. Against Garrett, uh, there is no public forum. Uh, so first up, we have a report um, in the name of uh, Mike Drummond uh, and Sue, if you'd like to perhaps come up as well, if there's any questions. Uh, and this relates to infrastructure holdings, financial statement of intent, corporate statement of intent. Mike, I'll hand over to you. Uh, welcome, Mark, as well. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, I will take the report as read. There's no corrections or updates to the report. I would draw councillors' attention um, to the dividends, the dividend policy. Um, current version has been included in the final statement of intent, uh, and the level of dividends has been increased slightly in year three by a million dollars. Um, other than that, the final statement of intent is, is consistent with the draft statement of intent you considered some months ago. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Is there anything, uh, Mark, or Sue, you'd like to add before I open it up to discussion? All right, thank you. <laughs> it may. <laughs> For the people on Zoom. Should have remembered the process. Right. Uh, open to questions. Mayor Smith, then Deputy Mayor Bryant. Just would like an update from Mike and Sue with respect to both the uh, dividends and the performance. If we note the purpose uh, under the statement of intent was uh, in establishing IHL to provide a funding vehicle to enable reduction in finance costs through the local government funding authority. Now, inevitably, when we did that, uh, everybody could look into a glass ball about what they thought interest rates might be, and it's been a pretty strange journey over the last three or four years since the decisions were made with interest rates. Uh, is it possible to update us uh, as a committee as to how the interest rates that we're receiving for the large capital borrowings of both Port Nelson and the airport now through IHL are tracking and then give some explanation as to how that is uh, flowing through into a dividend benefit uh, for the two councils, please. So, Thank you, Mayor Nick. I think we are confident that the uh, gain as a result of lower interest rates has been achieved and is being achieved by the instruments that we currently have in place. There are clearly opportunities at the present time for um, interest rate reductions based on the swap instruments uh, that are available in the market at the present time. And we have um, placed one such instrument in recent times. You asked us at a previous meeting, or it might have been a joint committee, I'm sorry, I don't recall which, um, to uh, give uh, a summary to the extent that we could have actual interest savings. So that's a piece of work for the first year that we 
aren't able to do until we get to the end of the annual reporting process. So we still have in mind that that's a piece of work you've asked for. So we are hoping to be able to demonstrate to you that with the changes in interest rates over the last year, that that um, saving has actually been achieved. Um, so I think by the time we next meet, we'll be able to give you that actual information to the extent that we can calculate it, of course, based on market rates versus LGFA rates. It's going to be a bit of a complicated process, but we're planning to um, do that exercise for you. So um, I think that's probably the most assurance I can give you at the moment, but we, we are confident that, we, um, that, that savings have been achieved. Whether they're at exactly the same level remain to be seen. The establishment costs are probably a bit higher than what were initially um, estimated. Um, the second part of the question was how they're flowing and through into dividends to the two councils. I note the dividends for the two last financial years were 5.2 and 5.2 for 23 and for 24. Uh, so what I'm keen to see is, is the benefit of the lower interest through the local government foreign, uh, funding authority being enjoyed by the companies or is it being enjoyed by the ratepayer with increased dividends? Uh, and that's the piece I'm just trying to crystallise out. So now I understand the, the comment that you've made about the interest rates. Um, I, I note the dividend for financial year 25 is set at 5.9, then 6.1. Um, that's not much more than the inflation at the moment. And so my question is, uh, when is the effectively the ratepayer going to enjoy the benefit of the IHL structure? Well, of course, the... Yep, so Of course, the dividends are um, a result of profitability of the subsidiary companies and the decisions made by the subsidiary boards as to appropriate levels of dividend. So um, it may be appropriate that you direct that uh, question to um, particularly Port Nelson Limited, but the process within... IHL that we are trying to establish is that there is a, an agreed set of principles on which dividend is calculated. And at the present time, you're receiving different levels of information. So the companies are using different metrics and different, um, let's call it calculation methods as, how they, as to how they arrive at an appropriate um, balance between dividend payment and retention of profits for future development, et cetera. And so in our dividend policy, we've tried to, we've got as far as establishing a set of principles, there's more work to be done. So as far as the actual dividend levels for IHL, <clears throat> excuse me, IHL's dividend will always be driven by the dividends it receives from the subsidiaries because IHL doesn't have any additional income itself. So IHL is a, um, a cost transfer vehicle, if you like, at this point in time. So the interest it pays out is uh, costed to the subsidiaries and the interest rate they pay. So the answer is, yes, the uh, dividend goes back, sorry, the um, interest benefit goes back to the subsidiaries and then gets recirculated by way of dividend. Your question around the absolute quantum of dividend is a factor of economic um, environment for the two subsidiary companies. So Perhaps I could put the question a bit, just if you come through the chair, but sure. the questions would be all good. Yeah, yes. So, Mike, what was your understanding when we set up IHL as to whether the benefit of the lower interest rates through the local government funding authority would be enjoyed by the companies or would be enjoyed in terms of increased dividends to council? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, the intention um, at the time was that the benefits of the lower borrowing costs would feed through to the company and then through to potentially higher dividends. I would make the observation, though, that in the current economic times, 
we may not see increased dividends because of the financial pressure that the port and the airport are under. Um, I would further comment that if we had not put the structure in place and the, the um, less, uh, the more cost-effective borrowing was in place, in fact, the dividends may have fallen um, in terms of what the previous stream of dividends was. Okay, so completely that line of questioning. Yeah. The first financial year uh, in which we will see in the annual report the benefits of the um, the lesser costs from the local government funding authority will be for the financial year that's just passed, if I look at the timetable of the, the debt transfer. Would it be possible, either through Mike or the holding company, just simply to provide a report as to what is that interest rate dividend? And the, and the answer is a fair one, and that is, well, um, neither the port company nor the airport are in relatively strapped financial times. Their commercial performance is not as good. And it's not that you're enjoying the benefit financially. It's just that your dividend would have dropped relative to the profitability of the businesses if it wasn't for it. I would still be interested in terms of when we come through the annual report for the year past and the three years of the statement of intent is for you to give us the estimate of what the benefits of the funding arrangement was uh, and how that is being enjoyed. Uh, if you be a bit direct about it, it is my intent to pursue the purpose, and that was for the councils, not the companies, to ultimately enjoy the benefit of the restructuring, given that it is the strength of the council's balance sheet that is enabling us to get the lower interest rates through the local government funding authority. It feels morally right that the benefit rests with the rate payer. Okay, thank you. So uh, that's a request for um, report further, factual, report further information. Report in the, and down the track. Yep, which is what Sue indicated um, is their intention. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bryant, and then I've got Councillor Sanson and Councillor Courtney. Thank you, Mr Mayor. For you to Sue, just in, uh, firstly in relation to your response initially to Mayor Smith, just around the um, question around the funding, you talked about having swaps uh, commercial swaps. I uh, just wondered, is that um, through the LGFA or is that on the open market, those swaps you talked about initially? Thank you. Good question for Mark. Thank you. So we do the borrowing through LGFA and then the hedging instruments, the interest rate swaps, we execute through Westpac because uh, LGFA doesn't provide that service. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I did have one about the statements of intent. Is that yeah, no, that, yes, that? yes, we are. Uh, this that is, is the topic for conversation, particularly around the airport. Just that you, uh, you've got quite a considerable jump in uh, debt next year, and I take it it's mainly to upgrade to rehabilitate the apron. Is that um, has that been on the radar for a little while? Ten million's quite a spike in your debt profile over one year. Just wondered if you thought about spreading that over a couple of years, or is that not viable? So, I'm not sure if it's your intention to ask each of the subsidiary companies uh, to answer some questions, but if it is, that would be an ideal uh, question at that point. So I'm more than happy. Um, if there's specific questions about the subsidiary companies, for example, the one Deputy Mayor Bryant just asked, I'm more than happy if the representatives or a representative of the um, either the port company and or the airport company are happy to come up to the table. Uh, maybe, yeah, Matt, thank you. Okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah, put it, yeah, it, it, it slightly towards you, you'll be right. Yep, lovely. Um, Simon Barr, acting C for the airport. Uh, the question was around the apron. The apron and the a borrowing to support during that, obviously. Yeah. So 10 million jump in one year is quite a lot on your debt profile. And and whether it could be deferred. I, th I think the answer well, always is spread over two years, I think, yeah. is the question. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think the reality is the works will be spread over more than one financial year. Um, but I'd also offer that the apron rehabilitation is a piece of work that probably should have been started earlier. So we can't defer commencement of the work, but it probably will be spread over two years. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Uh, Councillor Sanson. Thanks, Simon. 
Um, kia ora koutou. thanks through the chair. Um, my question's similar to um, Councillor Dowling's and um, on page 15 of our agenda and the IHL um, statement of intent, um, it's, there's a table showing the 10-year projected debt profile. I just note from years 2031 to 34, there's quite an increase in debt. And I'm just wondering, is that, you know, what pro what capital projects are planned then? Is it the um, wharf redevelopment? I had a look down into the um, statements of intent for each entity, um, and that was the only thing I could really see that might um, be attributed. Mate, do you have enough knowledge to answer that, or do you want to call someone from? Well, my recollection is it's, it's the replacement renewal of the wharf and the run, potential runway extension. So that's my recollection, and I'm happy to come back to the committee with definitive confirmation of that. So if we can get it confirmed now by, uh, by the airport or port in terms of the two the drivers for that, Simon, <laughs> welcome back. Okay, yo yo. Um, so for the port, I think I can confirm it is the wharf. Um, for the airport, it's um, respectfully, it's not the runway extension. That's not in our plan out to 2035. Um, but it will be the runway overlay. It's due for an overlay. Open works. There's also a consent package in at the moment for the bridging of Jenkins Creek. And once that's achieved, there's a program of development that ultimately is about $50 million over 10 years of commercial development. Okay, thanks, Simon. Did you get that clarification, Councillor Sanson? Yeah, and I'm um, just what what kind of what's the commercial development proposed for the airport? Uh, so there's a, a bridge over Jenkins Creek to open up a landlocked parcel on the eastern side um, that was severed when the Wakatu Drive went through. Um, we will construct a new car park over there and transplant the sort of the value car park, which is a collection of quite poor ad hoc surfaces that was always intended to be temporary. So we'll reposition the value car park to the other side of Jenkins Creek, and then we will continue development of hangars in response to demand and also to most likely rental car facilities to try and bring them back in the airport and just reduce the mileage that's spent circulating around the broader precinct. Okay, thanks for that. No further questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Simon, uh, for the clarification. Um, Councillor Courtney. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Tim. Sue, welcome. Um, you did make mention in your opening remarks or answering a question to Mayor Nick a moment ago about establ establishment costs, and they had perhaps run over. Have, have you got a final settlement, a final figure where they've settled those costs? I don't have a number in my head. Um, Mark, are you able to help out with that or not? Or should we, should we supply that separately? Yeah, if we could supply that se separately, we will have that information. You have a final figure, do you? Uh, yes, as we finalise the annual accounts, we do. I know the total cost, but I don't have the split between ongoing operational costs and establishment costs in my head at this point. No, I'll have the total costs, though, at this point, if you like, uh, Mark. I could, if, I could just come, if I could just come back with that, I just want to make sure I've got the figures absolutely right, because I just need to separate out all of the finance costs from the, if you like, the overhead costs. So, yes, I'd like to come back to the committee with the definitive numbers. I did hear you say, though, you had it, you had the total cost, but you still yeah. would say... So, be cautious. I, I, heard, I heard what was said. Yeah, that's all we say. If Mark yep. comes back to the yep. committee, um, I'll Perfectly happy my with email post this meeting um, Great. and provide you with that information. And then clearly the detail will be covered through the annual reporting process. So, um, so, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's all good. Uh, so you also mentioned, well, last time we were discussing IHL, you um, requested uh, you were going to establish a new position, a hard 0.5e FTE or something of that nature. I was just wondering what the, have that has that position been filled and what the duties are for the person who's yeah, filled that. Well he's he's sitting right there. wonderful Mark <laughs> who has taken that position it's less than um 0.5 at this stage. It's based on a 10 hour per week commitment. 
and it's a contracted role to IHL. It replaces the work that um, Daryl Weiner was doing for us previously through his Port Nelson role, at which stage there was a fee payment from IHL to Port Nelson to cover that work. Thank you for that. Uh, so early on in the piece when we were talking about the uh, this, the new entity and, and the organisations, um, there was a lot of talk about, uh, or so there was some talk about the wellbeing strategy. Um, and I know that what we we as this uh, as a governance are looking at is a, a lot on the commercial success and the stability, financial stability, and, and looking forward with the, the, the organisation. I want to just turn a wee bit of a focus away and just ask a question about how the how the organisation, at even at the senior management level, sees their well the implementation of the wellbeing strategy um, and, and the effects. It's kind of two stages, really, or two levels. One of them is, you know, how happy is your team at the management level? And and you know and job satisfaction and the happiness and well-being of the rest of the the whanau that they are all underneath uh, you guys and, and the work that you're doing. So that's one question, but sort of two parts. So, Chair, um, I think that at this stage would need to be answered at each of the subsidiary levels. So um, I wonder if the um, CEOs might okay. have a response. Chair. I guess then, as an overview, what sort of a, a vision, or rather not vision, but um, how aware are you at that senior level to, uh, across both organisations to be able to even comment on on that? Is that something that that is that you're actively participating in, or just letting the entities do their own thing? At this point in time, we've spent twelve months on the establishment and getting our. Um, piece of core business, the treasury process underway and uh, getting positioned with Mark and the executive officer role. So we've commenced our work on looking into the subsidiaries and the individual pieces of work they're doing. For example, today we will uh, review the risk management process within each subsidiary. So there, these pieces of work will come on incrementally as we move forward. So at this stage, um, there isn't, for example, a wellbeing policy from the group parent down. It will take a bit more time to establish those sorts of processes and to look at the extent to which we can share across the group. Okay, oh, I get through that share, I would challenge. Yeah, I would challenge yeah. that. And say that well-being really is something that that should be incorporated, and as you go, not as something that we do once we've got everything sorted. So I would, I'd really, really encourage that to you know even from a top-down level to to have that. Uh, but I guess I'll just ask the chair if we can. So do you want to hear from the two uh, subsidiary companies? So Simon, are you happy to comment or um, feel feel free to? Um, and someone from the port company, whether it's port or Q. How are your teams going? That's the, <laughs> the yeah. question. Sure, happy to comment. Um, pretty small team, so I think we all know each other pretty well. So I think we do have a pretty good finger on the pulse of people's mood. Um, we have an annual engagement survey. We do it routinely. Um, financial year before last was a pretty poor result. Um, there was a number of, uh, I guess, changes that we we're going through, and it was causing a bit of disruption. Uh, we had a net promoter score, e-promoter score that suggested quite a bit of improvement was needed and we have substantially turned that around. So the last uh, engagement survey, which would have been completed April, May, um, we had a positive score of 24 versus the year before, I think it was minus 40, then, so significant improvement. Um, we also do pulse surveys. Um, we did one about two weeks ago, just goes out to all staff, gets pushed out onto devices and people can say how they feel. So we don't get the results back on that yet, but... Okay, thank you. Uh, Hugh, would you like to come up? Yeah, um, Push the button, Hugh. As if I start with management, um, and this is anecdotal, we don't particularly survey management, but um, the commentary from our, our team is they probably the happiest they've been for many years. So I think that team is pretty united. From a, a wider team perspective, we've done uh, two 
broad surveys this year. One was safety, um, and that's using uh, our school team. And I think we, the team as a whole rated their safety um, the experience, if you like, at, at about 75% if I put a number on it. We then later on, six months later, we asked them about their well-being, particularly in, and their level of engagement. Um, we had some like 75% response, response and, and that score was at 69%. Uh, if we try to get a quantum on that, we know that from a port perspective, some ports are down at the low 50s and, and the upper ports are sort of around the, the mid 70s. So, you know, that's giving a sense of where we sit. Um, so generally, I think the support and enjoyment of the work is, is way up at the 80% mark. Uh, and there's a bunch of areas to work on, you know, largely, dare I say, which is a reasonably typical one around just managing poor performance and that, that communication style. So if I stood back, I think the team is in very good form, great culture, but there's always things to work on. Okay, thank you. Could, could I just... Uh, 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 yeah, uh, yes, uh, yes. So Telekoto, I'm Paul Zealand. I'm the chairman of the port, but I'm also a director of IHL. So being able to see through IHL into the subsidiaries is really important. Um, as a board, we also perform week, uh, monthly safety visits, all of us out into the field. We go meet the teams, we attend full box talks, and we directly engage with people to try and sense, to make sure that what we're hearing from management is actually reflected on the ground. And I must say, the culture of the port is pretty special. I work in a lot of companies, and I think there's a, a culture of caring and support where issues are allowed to come out and flourish and be dealt with. I think a lot of that's credit down to uh, Chief Executive Hugh Morrison, and, and many of you know is, is retiring this year, and, and we are determined to keep that culture going beyond Hugh's uh, tenure. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Paul and Hugh. Are there any further uh, questions, Mayor Smith? Yes, for Nelson uh, Airport Limited, I was interested in... Um, hey, Mus hang on, musical chairs again. Uh, sorry, guys. That's no, all good. <laughs> oh. Issue. And I think Simon's probably the, the, the right person. I was interested to know in the statement of intent, the basis for your future uh, passenger numbers, and that made me feel a bit pessimistic. Uh, that was uh, that pre-COVID, uh, we put 1.05 uh, million passengers uh, through, everybody except through the chaos of COVID that those numbers plummeted. It's one of the measures that we have of the state of our local visitor industry. Um, and even all the way out to financial year 28, uh, you, you, you don't see us recovering back to that 2019 position. Recently at the Mayor's Forum uh, with uh, Air New Zealand, they were a bit more optimistic. They've got some aircraft um, complexities of shortage of supply lines, uh, but their numbers in the domestic particularly out beyond uh, 25, 26, 27, they indicated they'd be replacing their Q300s uh, with more use of the ATRs on the key routes for Nelson. Uh, so the key bit I was keen is uh, what is the basis for your forecast for future passenger numbers? Uh, who have you engaged with around those? Um, is it that you're a pessimist uh, and I'm an optimist? Uh, or what's your what's your feel and your background to those numbers? So I'm very good question. Um, I don't know that we're pessimistic, um, somewhat conservative probably, but there's 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 nothing we know of that is going to generate a significant uplift over and above what we're forecasting. This is organic growth. This is uh, organic growth. So we've lost just Jetstar, which had a capacity in the market and pricing strategy that um, met a different demographic than the average New Zealand customer, I think it's fair to say. Um, we have, as part of our master planning work, which has underpinned the notice requirement and the plan change, uh, commissioned uh, Tourism Futures Limited originally to do some forecasting, and they had a, a cumulative growth rate up to 2040 of 1.8%. So we've assumed an, a, a faster growth rate in the near term, but tracking towards that cumulative average growth rate of 1.8% up to 2040 and beyond to 2050. 
I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, partly, have you engaged with Air New Zealand about their passenger forecasts on regional services and developing their own pass, or did your consultant? Yes, we do consult with Air New Zealand as part of the pricing work that we do with them. Um, so the passenger charges that they pay are predicated on a assumed trajectory of passenger numbers. And what we have in the pricing methodology will, will mimic what is in, in here. So. Massive dividend for the region uh, if we could get greater competition in our air services. As you noted, in 2019, we had Jetstar. Jetstar announced earlier this year that they were expanding some of their uh, jet services into Christchurch, for instance. Uh, do you see it during the statement of the intent of reattracting a key competitor on the provincial services that are so important to Nelson, particularly Auckland, Christchurch, Wellington? And now, I acknowledge we've got Sounds Air competition to Wellington, but not and on those key links to Christchurch yeah, and, 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 and Origin Air as well, yes. Um, I think it's reasonable that uh, one of our existing secondary airlines will grow. Um, I, I suspect this is public, so I prefer not to say more than that. Um, Jetstar has a strong preference for a single airline fleet region in, in New Zealand, being a jet, and obviously we're not a jet-capable airport, so um, I don't think there's much prospect of attracting Jetstar currently back into Nelson, no. One question. If the plan change in respect of the runway extension is approved, from a commercial point of view, does the board or the company have a view looking out to the future as to when you'll be most likely to move from not just having planning consent, but actually wanting the capital to make that investment in the longer runway? My view is that that would be driven by our main customer um, in New Zealand as to whether they will that end up paying for it ultimately through landing charges. It will need to be a strong requirement to extend the runway and it will come down to their needs ultimately. Can I stretch a bit further? It's quite clear it's not within the statement of intent because you've said in the next three years you're not intending. Uh, would you be so bold as to say as to what, within five, within 10, within 15? I think we're consistently saying within 10 to 15 years, the most likely trigger for it will be a new aircraft coming in to replace the Q300. And then New Zealand said that they're wanting to confirm that aircraft by 2030. Um, it is likely that that aircraft will be heavier on a seat for seat basis and need a longer runway. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, thank you for answering those questions. Is there anything? Oh, sorry, you. Sure. sorry, I just wanted to correct something I said earlier about the capex for the runway. There is some in the back end of this of the 10 year period in the, in the 2030s there is some in there but nothing before 2030. It's okay so in terms of that's an answer to a question that Councillor Sanson asked yeah, earlier. There's a correction for that there is there is an amount towards the back end of the 10 year forecast. Okay so um, Councillor Sanson did you pick up that correction to the previous answer? All right thank you. So, uh, just, so yes. Kia ora to Tino Koto, Quentin Hall Chair of, uh, of the airport so just wanted to just make the point that all of our development that's airside rolls into those charges that we recover from uh, from the airlines. So uh, many of the work that we do do has a strong business case moving forward that's baked into our landing fee. So so they work on the, uh, the runway overlay uh, and any extension and time and the apron work is all factored into that return. So um, so we're confident from that perspective that that airside work is, is, is uh, quality quality asset um, improvements. Okay, thank you. If there's nothing further, I've just got one question, uh, back to dividends. So in the staff report on page six, I think it is, the dividends 25, 26, 27 are 5.9, 6.1 and 8.1. In the statement of intent on page 16, I think I'm reading this correctly, correct me if I'm incorrect, but it has a table which basically is group forecast ordinary dividend 25, 26, 27, which is 5.9, 7.6, and 8.1. I know which of those numbers I prefer, but they do need to be the same numbers. Uh, through you. 
it appears um, that I've made a mistake within the report. I will check the numbers to ensure that the correct ones are advised to the committee. So, um, okay. Is, is it possible that the 7.6 is the correct number? Because that would be good. Very Open is heavy. Because that is in the actual st the statement of intent. Well, if I'm reading this correctly, it, that is the number contained in the actual statement of intent. The staff report that um, summarises the statement has the 6.1 in the middle year. Yes, the figures we had in the statement of intent were 5.9, 6.1 and 7.1. Yeah, and that was amended later on, which is covered in the resolution, which says the 7.1 moves to 8.1 in the third year. My, my question is, in the statement of intent that I'm reading, on page 16, it says 7.6 in year 2026. Doctor, well, I, I did think of doing that, but then I thought that would be rather unfair. I'm happy to take it and clarify. Apologies for not being right on the board. It's, it is my, effectively my third week of time. That's, <laughs> That's right. Well. It's just so clar clarification of the numbers is important. You know, someone may uh, look back at the point in time where it's paid and go, hey, you're sure? Or more preferably, actually, you've, it's, it's extra. Mike. Uh, through you, I'll, I'll need to just check the source of the numbers and, and confirm um, that the correct ones are provided to the committee. Certainly, um, additional um, dividends uh, in 2026 uh, would be favourable. Yeah. Okay. When would you like to provide that information? I apologise for bringing out now. I literally only, as a question of dividends, was going through. I was. <laughs> Uh, through Mr. Chair, oh, I expect to have advices out to the committee by close of business tomorrow. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sanson. Um, kia ora, thanks, Tim. I've just got um, one final question. Just in regards to the um, replacement for the Q300, do we know what that what um, model that might be? What plan? Uh, Simon? I thought that one might be for me. Um, no. Plane doesn't exist the moment, is the likely answer. It's, uh, there aren't any, sorry. Uh, New Zealand's unlikely to select a plane that currently exists. Okay, so did you say the plane doesn't exist yet? Correct. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much. Right, thank you, Councillor Stanton. So um, there is a resolution contained uh, in the report. Is someone prepared to move the resolution subject to the clarification of two bits of information? The, the issue of the scale of the dividend and the statement of intent is is material. Um, and so I do think before we adopt the statement of intent, we need to be clear as to whether the dividend in 2026 is 7.6 or the 6.1. How quickly can that be clarified between the IHL board and our staff? Uh, three, Mr. Matt. Um, um, Mayor Smith, could you repeat that? I was distracted and I didn't hear sure, that. So I'm, not, I'm not comfortable adopting the statement of intent well, without the clarity of, of the number of the dividend. It's one of the most important things for the council. It's not something I'm relaxed about. It's a difference of 1.5 uh, million. Uh, okay. So how quickly that can that be clarified? I clarify it now, now um, Mayor Smith. So apologies, um, I had the wrong older version, previous version. So it's totally my fault. I wasn't on the circulation list for the papers, so apologies. It is 5.9, 7.6, and 8.1, and I clarify that. So 5.9 and 25, 7.6 and 26, 8.1 and 27. And that's correct. Those figures are correct. I'm correct. happy to then move that's the correct. adoption of the adoption well, of the yes. statement of intent on that clarity. Uh, thank you. Move, Mayor Smith. Uh, just a clarifying question, if I may, uh, right. through you, Chair. So... Is the reason in the staff report, is that just a typo or is the reason for the bump in the dividend as a result of the benefit that was gained on establishment through the um, funding changes? Uh, through Mr. Chair, no, it's not related to the funding changes. We would have made a simple typographical error in preparing the report. 
So the extent to which the, the dividend in years, both 25, 26, and 27, are affected will be reflected through the information that we're going to receive as part of the annual report, which will clarify the underlying profitability of both the subsidiaries and to the extent that it's possible to calculate the impact of the interest rate um, advantage of shifting to the LGFA. I'm sorry, for clarification, just so we're all clear, the figures that we are using in the resolution are 5.9, 7.6, and 8.1. Right, yep, as per as contained in the statement of intent included in the agenda. Yep, Mayor Smith. Oh, just just in moving it, I'm a lot more comfortable uh, with that level. It did seem that those numbers were light historically, and as I noted in my very first question, were not much more than inflation. With the corrected figures, uh, I feel a lot more comfortable at the dividend levels that are pleased to move yeah. into oh, I wish I'd seen it earlier. We might have shortcut the first the first half of the conversation. Anyway, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Seconding uh, Councillor McKenzie. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against Kerry, just before we move off the subject, uh, firstly, thanks to um, Simon, Quinton, Paul and Hugh um, for coming in, answering those questions in relation to the subsidiaries. Um, and given, Hugh, I suspect this is your last meeting that you'll potentially attend. Ah, well, in terms of from joint shareholders and uh, given that this is, uh, I guess, the joint shareholders meeting, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of Tasman District Council um, for your contribution to Port Nelson over the period of time that you've been here, which has happened to coincide with some very interesting times uh, in the, well, generally speaking, but particularly in the whole shipping, transport, um, logistics um, uh, arena, both globally and, and nationally. So um, thanks uh, for your contribution and, and best wishes with what I think is retirement as opposed to uh, a shift to some other role. So, um, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed working with you over the period of time, both um, as a director and also uh, in my role as representing the shareholders. So, thank you. No. Uh, Nelson City Council would want to strongly endorse on the public record at the shareholders meeting, Hugh. Um, there's always a tension between any port company that's operating so closely to a city. And uh, we acknowledge your effective leadership of the port, uh, but acknowledging your service would also want to uh, acknowledge the very constructive and open door that you have had with some of the civic issues that interact uh, with the port company. And we'll have more to say at the AGM, but totally endorse the comments of the chair and the thank you for your uh, huge service uh, to Port Nelson Limited. Righto, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your attendance. So now we'll move, or do I not put it? Oh, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, Gary. I now look for a resolution to move into committee. So moved. Uh, move Mayor Smith, our seconded Councillor Dowler, uh, with the addition that, uh, Sue, you are able to stay should you wish to. Um, She's not sure. <laughs> but you, you, you don't have to if you have another person of engagement, by all means. Um, but that's all good. Yeah, you, that's all good. You can you can escape at whatever point you wish to. Um, but uh, in terms of the resolution, we will enable your continued attendance while we're in committee. Uh, so we have a move and a second. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. So we are now in committee.